Hello, welcome back to our Super Saturday. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the morning session. And before we start with Jude, I just had a couple of questions uh, from the session from uh, the school at Heartland. Um, and I want us to go through them with you all, if that's okay, Jude. Um, one of them was um, looking at Arabic. So we deliver Arabic twice a week to the Foundation Stage children. And um, they're 25 minute sessions and based on songs, rhymes and games. And they're delivered within the classroom environment. And our classroom environment at Heartland is split into two halves. We have a wooden divider um, down the middle of the classroom and we have two um, classrooms within one, if that makes sense. So there's 10 children in one bubble, 10 children in the other bubble. The teacher and the teaching assistant move across both bubbles, obviously sanitizing between each movement. Um, and each bubble, so each mini classroom, is the same as the other as the other side to make sure that it's fair and consistent for the children um, and that takes the time because you're doubling up everything but it, it works really well another question we had was regarding the resources and sanitization so every um within the classroom we have different areas and there's at least 10 different areas and every child has their own chair and there's a spot between each area the children are encouraged to be socially distant to make sure that they're on the spot or by their chair, which has their photo and their name on it. And each area after a child's used it is sanitized um, by the teaching assistant or the teacher to ensure we're minimizing that risk. Uh, and yes, the children are in two different bubbles. I think that was the question really. But at any point, if you've got any other questions for me, please feel free to put it into the, the feed, into the Zoom chat, and I can, I'd be more than happy to answer those. So welcome back. Um, so we've got our keynote uh, speak Jude here. And today she's going to be talking to us about supporting smooth transitions in the early years. Now, um, I've had the pleasure of meeting Judith um, earlier this week on Zoom. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was so excited. I think she could tell the how, how excited I was uh, when uh, she came on just to introduce herself. Um, and um, Jude is um, a part-time assistant head at primary school and also a part of independent consultants. So it seems like she never sleeps and she's up here as well. <laughs> and as well. Uh, she's worked in education since the mid 1980s uh, and across uh, most of primary. And she's been an early years consultant and trainer for her local authority in England. And um, she's also worked for Early Excellence uh, as, uh, as well as a trained Ofsted inspector. And she's still smiling. So that's great to see. <laughs> she's got three grown up children and a grandchild, and she loves singing in a gospel choir, which sounds amazing. And I'd love to hear um, a, a song maybe at the end, Jude. Maybe we can all join in with oh, you. Oh, <laughs> That'd be fantastic. So I'm going to pass over to Jude now, and um, I hope everyone enjoys the session. Any questions, please let me know. Well, that was a chance. You want to hear me sing? Oh, my goodness. Some of my ex-colleagues, um, some of you will know Jan de Beel. He used to d cringe. Um, if ever I said we're going to sing together, but never mind. Uh, I think some of you will have attended my uh, music session, so you'll see how ropey the voice is getting at the moment. Um, but it's a real joy to be with you today. I wish I was with you physically, uh, because here it's still rather dark, and I'm sitting here with lots of lights on to try and look as if it's the middle of the day, but it's still rather dark here in England. And I want to also do a shout out to the um, BSAC team transition from EYFS to Key Stage 1 seminar. I watched that yesterday and I was just blown away with what you're doing there. So please, if you haven't had a chance to have a look at that, uh, that seminar, please do have a look because they go into a lot of practical detail. I'm not going to be going into that much detail today um, because... I want to do something different with you. I did want to start with the Sam Cooke song. I know a change is coming. A change is going to come. And the, these are the words in the first verse. It says, I was born by a river in a little tent. Well, I wasn't really, but you know, that's the song. And, and just like the river, I've been running ever since. A change is going to come. Um, and it's that sense of change is with us. Preparing for this speech, I think, has been one of the most difficult things I've done for a long, long time. It surprised me because I, I leapt at the chance to talk about transition. I've talked about it for years. I've been on courses about it. I've delivered courses about it. I felt really equipped and knowledgeable about the subject of transition. I've been passionate about 
getting it right as children move from early years into year one. Um, I've been passionate about children as they move from preschools into, into the school sector. And so I felt this was going to be easy. And then what happened was we were hit with a global pandemic. And also going back into school, because I'd been out of school for quite a long time, going back into school really made me slightly uneasy. I felt a little bit, what do I know? What do I know? And it robs you of your confidence a little bit. So I come to you as a fellow traveler, um, somebody who's still not sure about what is happening in our world and somebody who constantly is learning. And I also didn't want to give you a whole lot of PowerPoint slides and look really clever today. I wanted to share. I wanted to do it as if we're sitting down over a cup of coffee. In fact, I do have my cup of coffee here, which says dream big on it. But I want to invite you on my own journey. I want you to reflect with me. I want you to pause for a minute and let's just think about what it really, really matters when we're talking about this subject of transition. And I want to reflect also on the last 12 months that we've had internationally. I read the definition of transition the other day, which talked about it being the process of changing from one state to another state. And it made me think of Brexit. And um, some of you may have heard of that thing called Brexit, where we were constantly in transition for about three years of, is it and isn't it, what's happening? Um, a year ago, I made the decision to become a vegetarian because my kids were doing it. And uh, I, I did go around for several weeks saying, I'm in transition. Um, when I stole the bacon butty, or that bacon sandwich, from the staff room breakfast when everybody had left because I could smell the bacon and I thought oh I'm a vegetarian I can't eat it I was still in transition that was that was my um, justification for that but I do want to say right from the start that one of the certainties we have in our lives is that change is happening and change is coming we live in the permanent state of change. To be alive is to be changing. And there's no escape from it. Now, some of you as adults are thinking, oh, I don't like change. Well, that's fair enough. But unfortunately, we are in a period of rapid change. And the last 50 years or so, and, and that gives my age away, but the last 50 years or so has seen incredible change in how we live our lives. Prior to that, that it may be that you'd stay in one job for life. I mean, I thought I'd be in teaching for life, whereas I had 10 years out doing other things, partly having babies. But you'd stay in the same job for life. You'd probably live in the same home for your whole life. You'd live near your family and your friends for life. Think about what it's like now. Constant change. And many of you will have known what it's like to move from one country to another country from one school to another school. So life is forever changing, forever changing. And, and this year, this last year, this last 12 months, we've seen incredible change and our, we weren't prepared for it. There was no easy transition into where we are now at. at the end of March last year, the UK went into a whole national lockdown, as many of you know. This time last year, I was meant to be in China, um, working with some schools there. And guess what? <laughs> China got it first and, and we had to uh, cancel the trip and cancel the flights and everything. It stopped suddenly. I went from being constantly on the road, rushing around, um, as Amina introduced me, to suddenly being at home with three grown up kids. I went from being on a train, being on an airplane, to walking around the block. It was really tough. I was blessed to still be working in school at that time and working through some of the, the, the difficulties of being in lockdown in school. And at least I was able to get out. But everything else came to an abrupt halt. And then in the middle of it, my mum had a stroke. And those of you who watched my music uh, seminar will hear me talk about this. She had a stroke, went in, went in and out of hospital. She also had dementia. And she tested positive for COVID right in the middle of it all. And as a family, we had to stop doing what we had been doing and think how we could best support our 84-year-old parents. And as a result, I drove three hours up to Derby from Ipswich in the UK 
um, every other week to spend four or five days caring for my parents. So I didn't know where I, where I belonged. I wasn't here and I wasn't there. I was, had a home in Ipswich. I worked in Norwich, but I was traveling up to Derby. It was in a state of flux. And many of you will have experienced that feeling of being betwixt and between. We don't know where we quite belong. Fortunately, during my time, my visits to Derby, um, I met up with one of my oldest friends who had also moved to Derby and another friend who took me round to a park every time I came and he showed me the beauty of Derby. I'd always thought it was like an industrial uh, city with not much going for it. It made all the difference, that personal connection. And this is me I want you to hold on to. Um, I'm not just chatting on here and wasting time. I want to build a picture that we all know what transition feels like. And we all know what important things there are. So I'm going to share my slides now. I'm not going to be doing loads and loads and loads of slides for you. You'll be fortunate to hear. Um, but here we go. Let's see how it works. Hopefully you can now see my slides. And I want us to think about something called the shaky bridge of transition. Um, as I was preparing for this, I, I did lots and lots of reading up and lots of looking at different sources. And I came across this, which I found really useful in thinking about my own life changes, but also the life changes that our children and families go through. Um, as you can see here, we've got a family setting out on that shaky bridge. Um, they're settled, everything's fine and comfortable. And then they make that decision to move. Think about yourself when you made the decision to work in the school where you now work. You probably grappled with it for quite a while. Think about your children that you receive into your school or that you're sending to another place. They have no choice. They have no say in whether they do that or not. The decision is made for them. And later on, I'm going to be thinking about how we can probably give them a little bit more choice within this so they feel in control. Because most of the time when we transition, we've got some choice in it. During lockdown, we had no choice. Then we do all the preparations, the packing and the, the saying goodbyes, and we come to that final end. We have a big party, maybe, or not, a Zoom party. And then we come to that phase, which I think is really important for us to remember, the chaos the in-between, where we're not where we were and we're not yet where we will be. It's called a liminal space, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And then we come through that and we start to accept where we're going to be. I, I'm now in Derby and I'm living here. I've started to accept that this is where I am and it's a new beginning for me. We start to explore, we start to get a bit more brave and we go out and explore our, our place where we're now living. And we start to adapt until we've got that new normal, that settledness. That's useful in thinking about ourselves, and I don't know where you're at at the moment in terms of your own transitions and your own journey. But think about it for our children and think about what that means for them. Where are they at? At the moment, I think we're often moving across this bridge. We're, we're not quite in the new normal. And I know for, for you um, in, in the Middle East, um, there's all sorts of different restrictions that still go on, although things are opening up. We're back and forth in this time of transition. It's difficult. But think through some of the feelings you may well have had. I wonder what feelings you had when you were changing to the school that you're now in. What are some of the feelings that you've experienced in that space, that chaotic space? Pause for a minute. If we were live, I'd have you having a chat about this. It's maybe talk to the screen and tell it a few things or jot down a few things. And what helps you during that period? Um, here's a few images of just um, some of the changes and the transitions that we go through in life that might help you to reflect on that. How did you feel when you got your suitcases on the trolley and you set off on that journey? when you had to say goodbye to loved ones, and we've all had to do this in our lives. I lived in South Africa for 10 years, and nine years, and, and I was always like this at the airport when I came back to the UK and then had to go back to South Africa. It was that constant change and, and sadness. 
Um, the packing up of boxes. I mean, this this could have been me just a few months ago. But we're, we're inundated with boxes. We're packing, we're packing, we're packing all the time. But maybe some of you have had a baby and there's that big major life transition. How did that feel? What helped? Some of you may have got married or made the decision to be in a, a committed relationship with somebody. Huge transition. And then some of you may be at the other end of that and it's all fallen apart and you've had your heart broken and uh, you're transitioning into a new way of being. For some, there's grief. For some, there's joy. During this period, I think we've experienced a whole tumultuous amount of feelings and emotions. In, at the moment, still in that state of transition, we're, we're in that chaos of the in-between. Transition is all about, we're not what we were, but we're not yet what we will be. It's a period of uncertainty. It can cause anxiety and fear, whilst it's also tinged with anticipation and hope. There's that excitement, but there's also that fear. There's that sense of oh, an adventure, whereas it would be much easier to stay settled. And that liminal space, I started to explore that. I'm part of a group called Liminal, and I didn't quite know what it was. I thought it was quite a catchy title. But when I looked it up, I, I thought, ah, it's the time between <clears throat> the what was and the what's next. It's a place of transition, a season of waiting, a season of not knowing. Think about your children, where they're suddenly taken from a place of settledness, something that's become normal for them, into a place of unsettledness, something that they don't quite know what it yet feels like. And transition is that place of waiting. And one of my favorite authors, um, the Franciscan monk, Richard Raw, talks about transition um, as where we're betwixt and between the familiar and the completely unknown. That there's the old world left, world left behind. We're not quite sure of the new world. It's a, and he calls it a good space. A good space where genuine newness can begin. I think that's fantastic. Sometimes we look at transition as being a really difficult time um, and, and quite a painful time and something we've got to grapple with. But it can be a really good space where newness begins. And he talks about getting there often. <laughs> I don't know about that. But he said it's a sacred space where the old world is able to fall apart and a bigger world is revealed. That period of time is always helped and supported if we've got um, somebody walking alongside us. Someone who knows a little bit more about it than we do. Think about our children, how much they need emotional connection, particularly during periods of change and transition. They need some elements of familiarity. For myself, when I was moving up to Derby, I, I had all my stuff with me. But when I moved to South Africa, I had one suitcase and my guitar. My guitar travelled with me all over the world. Um, and it was that familiarity. It was my, my security blanket, um, or as we refer to it in England, the blankie, the thing that you suck when you're really nervous. I took my guitar with me. It's important also that we have something that we can take hold of and take control of during this period. And we need to remember that for children, change is part and parcel of life. They're always changing. I've put up here a picture of Lucas, my grandson, uh, when he was born. This was taken just hours after his birth as he was leaving the hospital. Um, he was tiny. He was totally dependent on the adults around him. He could not survive, unlike many of the animals in the animal kingdom who they're born and within minutes they're up on their feet because it's survival and they've got to get out there and run around. But change for children is part and parcel of their lives. Uh, this is him 18 months later. Uh, he looks like a little terror. He's not, he's delightful, but he's got those teeth. I love this photo of the four teeth and that sort of funny expression as he sits on my lap. Um, but he doesn't stop changing. He doesn't settle in it forever. Here we go. He's now three years old and this is what he looks like. Change is always happening for our children. They go from the newborn to being a walker and a talker, from the tantrums of a two-year-old to the tantrums of a teenager. 
It's always changing. Children are constantly learning. They're constantly seeking out new experiences. Every day is a new experience for them. Their exploratory drive keeps them pushing forwards. It keeps them saying, what's next? Bring it on. And doing that from a secure base of connection is an adventure for them. When they don't have that secure base, it then becomes a threat. Sadly, as adults, we don't continue to keep this uh, joy of change going. And many adults talk to me about how they find change difficult. Somebody once said to me, choose your rut carefully because you'll be in it for the next 40 years. <laughs> I thought that was quite useful uh, as I was approaching uh, my 40th birthday. We adults find change very difficult. Children can be incredibly resilient and adaptable. And I came across uh, this as I was reading another book recently, and he said change is the easy bit, but transition, which is the, tra the psychological process people go through to come to terms with that change, is the difficult part. It reminds me of uh, when, when I go into classrooms and, and support people to move it around. The changing of the furniture is not the problem. That's easy. We can change a bookcase, we can change a shelf unit, put a few more resources out. But the changing of hearts and minds, the psychological process is so much more difficult. And I remember once working in an outdoor area in a nursery and me and the teacher got so excited and the support staff were all standing there going, what's happening? We'd forgotten the importance of talking to them about the why we're doing it. Because of that psychological change. Transition is a process. It's a journey. Let's keep that in mind as we move through this session. It's not a day. It's not an event. It's not even a policy document. Transition is this process that takes time. Um, something else that popped up as I was preparing this was um, I, I was doing a survey on SurveyMonkey about something I'd attended. And, and this popped into SurveyMonkey, which was quite interesting. How to adapt and thrive in times of crisis. Um, and I, I, can't, I couldn't find who it was by, I had to pay to get into it and that. But it was just the headlines that, as they came up, I thought, oh, that's interesting. It talks about two traits that make us especially suited to adapt, survive, and even thrive. And these are useful when we think about transition. One is curiosity, that exploratory drive, the willingness to step out of the known into the unknown. Now, for children, they're not always willing <laughs> sometimes they have to be dragged into it they have no choice but they do have curiosity they do have an exploratory drive that drives them forwards into a new experience and a new adventure and so how can we capitalize on their natural curiosity as they transition into our setting and out of it the other thing it talks about is agility and i, I think another word for this is flexibility uh, something that physically I don't have, I'm, I'm not very fit at the moment. I did do Patch to Five running in the last lockdown this time because it's winter and I'm just eating all the time. So I'm not very agile. But this is the ability to, to change quickly and adapt. And just this morning, somebody tweeted, and I have retweeted it, um, th these words which really resonated. If a system is so rigid it cannot meet the needs of a child, then it's a broken system unfit for purpose. Systems should flex and adapt to meet the needs of the child, not the other way around. I thought that was great. This is about that agility. Our systems need to be flexible to adapt to the needs of the child. Um, my, my other half, he's, he's um, a retired engineer, and he talks about the difference between soft systems and hard systems. Hard systems are, are those things in engineering that you, this, is, this has gone wrong, so you fix it that way. And it, it's very clear cut. But soft systems is when you're working with people where it isn't as clear cut. There isn't a one size fits all. And I'm so passionate about us as the system being flexible and adaptable to meet the needs of our children. Um, particularly when we're thinking about moving from one place to another. Think about our children, they're moving from being the oldest and at the top 
at being the youngest and at the bottom. They move from something really secure to something unknown. They move from the known to the unknown. They're saying goodbye to one thing and hello to lots of new things. And one of my strong beliefs is that we should be aiming to reduce the number of transitions that children go through within their school experience. And, and one of my dreams is that I I'm part of a school where we've done away with this yearly transition for children, where it's so smooth that the big transitions are into the school and then out of it at the other end. But that year on year, we just build on what's gone on before. You know, we waste so much time as children transition, particularly from early years into year one in this country, um, where, where so much time is wasted teaching children a new way of doing things and a new way of being. And my dream has been, let's smooth that out so that the change is gradual over time. Yes, we need to have time at the start of every year to re-establish um, the expectations and establish good relationships. But I've put this picture up here about my urge for us to turn the heat up gradually. Many of you will recognize the, the image of the frog. If you take a frog and put it in a pan of water um, and you turn the, the, the heat on, it will sit there. It won't jump out because it will adapt its body temperature to the heat and eventually die um, because it'll get boiled alive. Now, that's often an analogy for um, bad things, but I want to use it in a positive sense. Rather than plunging our children into the hot water of the formality of what comes next, turn the heat up gradually. Treat transition as if it is a child development stage. We don't suddenly wake up one day and say to a baby, it's the day to start walking today. Come on, on your feet, get walking. It's a lengthy period. And that is my desire is that smooth transitions are the gradual increase of the heat rather than plunging in, them into hot water on day one. We approach it within school gently. So let, let's think particularly now about the main players within transition. And, and I would say our starting point is to look at need. As that quote from Twitter um, said, it's about focusing on the needs. Who needs what? And remember, within this journey, there are not just, there's not just the child or there's not just the school, but there's the parent. I always say to people that uh, when you get a child, you don't get them on their own. They bring their family with them. And it's true. They're not just a little entity. They come with their families. They come with their parents, with their structures, their home structures. And if, if I was with you now, again, I'd, I'd say, well, have a chat with the person next to you. If you're sitting watching with your team at the moment, you might want to uh, come back to this later on and think about, well, what are the needs of each of these players on, in this journey that we're on? What are the needs of parents during periods of transition? What are the needs of us as the school? And by teacher, I mean the school system. And what are the needs of the child? And it might be useful for you to think about those, try and get into the mind of each of those different people. And, and I've, I often draw on the work of Julie Fisher. Um, she's somebody that I respect highly and I know that uh, the school on the um, Key Stage 1 video referred to her work on moving in, into Key Stage 1. Well, this is from her book, Starting from the Child. And, and I would propose that when we are thinking about transition, we don't start with our systems, we start with the child in mind. And, and this quote, I think, is very powerful about when we see things through the child's eyes, do we truly understand what's involved in making adjustments from the one setting to the next? See the world through the child's eyes. I wonder what that looks like. I can remember when I worked in a children's centre, which was attached to a school. Uh, I, I was trying to challenge transition within the school. And one of the things they were insisting on was that on day one in September, all the reception children, all the four-year-olds would line up on the playground with their parents, like the rest of the school. All of them in, same day, lining up, 
and come in together. And I was arguing about this and saying, that's traumatic, that's really difficult, and we, we need to do things gently and gradually and build relationships. And parents need to talk to the children and children need to talk to the teacher and we need to have this conversation going on, but they insisted. And so I decided to do something practical. And I went out on the playground on that first day and I got down on my knees and I joined the line. And I think this photo sums up that feeling. I'm four years old and I'm looking up at legs. It's a, it's a forest of legs. And just, just around the back of those other legs, there's another child who's sobbing and crying. And there's, it's just confusing. I was terrified as an adult. And just meeting the eyes of some of those children, oh my goodness, it broke my heart. I'd like to say everything changed, but unfortunately it didn't. But maybe we should all be on our knees, seeing the world through the eyes of the child. What does your classroom look like for those children? Do you go around on your knees looking at what's in their eye line? What are they gonna see? What's the first thing they see when they come in on that very first day? What do they see? How do they feel? How does it make them feel? And again, it reminds me of, of this quote here. We know that happy children, we know that happy, well-settled children learn better and have higher well-being. We know that children need support to adjust and move from place to place. They need support in that liminal space. If we hold children in the highest regard and place priority on their needs, then a transition plan that caters to their needs is essential. So maybe some of you are thinking about transitions into and out of your setting. Does your transition plan have the highest regard for children and place the highest priority on their needs? And this takes me back time and time again. Some of you will recognize this. Maslow's hierarchy. I worked on a transition project um, with, with a colleague several years ago now um, in a local authority. And we eventually came down to using Maslow's hierarchy as a way of exploring how successfully we were encouraging smooth transitions in our settings. And I don't want to go into it in a lot of detail, but you will see, and I, and I put on the slide here, uh, just some of the aspects that we might need to tune into when we think about transition. Thinking about toileting, to be honest, most children want to just know where the toilet is. When they start in, in school, in your setting, and when they move to their next place, they wanna know where's that toilet. No wonder they have so many accidents if we don't show them. Um, they want to know where the food is. To be honest, when I go anywhere, I want to know when's lunchtime. And some of you are thinking that right now. Oh, come on, Judith, it's nearly lunchtime. They want to know, want to know where our lunch is. Have we got a drink? It's really practical things for transition. Those practical things which children need to know. They need to know, are they safe in this place? Is there protection for them? And over the COVID, this has been more than relevant to us all. Where children, I think, have adapted really well to constant sanitizing um, and, and wearing masks and all sorts of things. They've adapted to that. Love and belonging. They want to know, is this a community that I will belong to? How do we build a sense of belonging from day one? How do they get that sense that this is a place that needs me? I am significant in this place. There are people that care for me here. And that links really well with esteem, um, where that community, that relationship, builds a sense of respect and recognition. Uh, when I'm working here in the UK, I, I talk about respect quite a lot. Um, and do we pronounce people's names correctly? Because I remember my own three children, who are Kanyisa, Tabo, and Sipo, lovely South African closer names. Um, each of them would have their name pronounced wrongly and it would frustrate them and anger them. And it never gave them that sense that I'm being recognized and I'm being acknowledged for who I am. Now I know over in the Middle East, you are experts in names. So I don't need to say much about that. But if we're going to get to this point of, of personal growth and potential and, and that zooming ahead as children grow through our year in, in our class, 
we have to have all of those other things in place as well. It won't just happen from day one. So maybe take that away and look at it as a model with your team for transition and the needs of children. Also, have a look at the well-being and involvement. Now, I know many of you in the Middle East have been using the Leuven scales, and, and if, you're, if you're not amongst the people who've used them, I would really commend them to you. But tuning in to children's well-being and involvement, we've started doing this right across our school up to year six, and it's been really important during this uh, period of time to continually tune in to children's well-being and involvement. How settled are they? How much are they comfortable in their own skin? How deeply engrossed do they get? And here's some images from my own school with the tongue sticking out, with the, the joy of being on that bike, with the focus and the concentration of using those tools. So have a look at, at those learning scales, particularly at times of transition. My, my old um, line manager um, in the local authority did her doctorate on uh, transitions and used the learning scales uh, as part of that exploration. And uh, the 10 action points, some of you will be attending that workshop and, and looking at it. And these are some of the questions that I'll be asking, which are really pertinent during times of transition. Is this environment welcoming? Is it comfortable? Is it familiar? Is it reassuring? Do children have a sense of belonging very quickly there? What resources might I need to help children to settle in? Does the routine allow them time to make some choices, time to get deeply immersed. Can they follow their own interests? We provide good time to just talk, not about an agenda, but talking time. Are the adults available? Are they stimulating? Are they accessible? Are they warm? So the 10 action points based on um, the learning scales really do help us to consider what we're doing during times of transition. But I want to also be, think about uh, being mindful of the needs of parents. Um, and as a parent myself, uh, I don't think I was a particularly good parent and I will not say that I was an expert parent. And I don't think I was a well-behaved parent either, but my kids seem to appreciate me. Um, but be mindful of the needs of the parents. I can remember putting my first child into school. We had just moved from South Africa to Edinburgh in Scotland. And I remember walking around the supermarket um, crying because I didn't know what to put in my child's lunchbox. I, did, I wanted her to fit in. I wanted to not stand out and be different. I wanted to do the right thing. And I was, I was crying and, and I approached somebody and I said, I'm sorry, I've just moved to this country. I don't know what to put in a school lunchbox. And very kindly, they helped me. They were a little bit shocked, but they helped me. Um, Remember that parents are people too. They've got needs. And I came across this poem that I want to read with you because I think the reading of the poem is, is really important. He started school this morning and he seemed so very small as I walked there beside him in the kindergarten the hall. And as he took his place beside the others in his class, I realized how all too soon those first few years can pass. Remembering I saw him as he first learned how to walk, the words that we learned made out when he began to talk. This little boy so much absorbed in learning how to write, it seems as though he must have grown to boyhood overnight. My eyes were blurred when, as hastily I brushed the tears away, lest, lost by some word or sign of mine, I mar his big day. Oh, how I long to stay with him and keep him by the hand, to lead him through the places that he couldn't understand. And something closely kin to fear was mingled with my pride. I knew he would no longer be a baby by my side, but he must have his chance to live, to work his problems out, the privilege to grow and learn what life is all about. And I must share my little boy with friends and work and play. He's not a baby anymore. He's in kindergarten today. Oh, that was really quite sweet. Parents have real feelings. They feel that when they're letting them go for the first time. And a friend of mine is a, a, a manager in a nursery. And she says, during this lockdown time, during COVID, the babies have taken longer to settle because these babies have been born in lockdown 
only seeing maybe two people or even one person. And suddenly they're launched out into a setting with lots of other people. And she said the settling has taken a lot longer, both for the parents and the children. But it reminds me that parents are people at the end of the day. I, I was in floods of tears when my children went to secondary school. I felt I was losing them forever. <coughs> it was worse for me than <coughs> when they went into reception, particularly for my third child, because he came into my class. I was little, I was Mrs. Mummy. He didn't know whether I was Mrs. Twarmy or, or Mummy, so he called me Mrs. Mummy. But when they went to secondary, it was like I'd lost them forever. I felt out of control. One of the things that we worked on in, in several schools where I've worked is having tea and tissues at the start of the year where the parents take the child to their classroom and then we provide a safe space for them to come and have a cup of coffee, to have a little cry with their tissues. and We'd cry with them, but just to have that reassurance just over those first few days. And it really helped to build relationships. It really helped to meet the needs of those parents. And we've done it in my current school and we've only had one or two take, take advantage of it. But for those one or two, it made a difference. So think about the needs of your parents. Remember, they all have different needs. They all come with different baggage and different experiences. And it's tuning into those needs as well. I'm going to pause for a moment here and just allow you a five minute pause to reflect on what I've said so far. I'm really setting the scene. The second half of my talk, really, we're going to dig a bit deeper into some of the key elements that I feel are really important to, to, to look at and to consider during times of transition. And I want us to pause. And if you're with your buddies at the moment, you can have a little chat about this reflect on the needs of the child and the needs of the parent. How could Maslow's hierarchy influence transition? Now I know Maslow's hierarchy is quite old now and there's lots of other things that have come in but I still think it is worth looking at. What about turning the heat up gradually? How did you feel about that and the buff on in the, in the pan? And maybe have a five minute wriggle and if you've got any questions, start feeding them through in the chat. So we've got five minutes from here. So it'll be 8.05 when we join back. So I leave my camera on so I can just keep smiling at you. Take a moment.
We've got one more minute and then we will reconvene. Okay, it's eight. It's uh, it's eight oh five here. The sun is up, uh, so I've switched my main light on. Um, I know it's it's lunchtime for you, so uh, you're all hungry. And Maslow's hierarchy of human need means that if I don't hurry up, you're all going to switch off and start eating. Um, I haven't even had my breakfast yet, so I know how you're feeling. Did a couple of um, good questions in the chat here, and uh, hopefully in the second half we will start to address some of them, um, but during the question and answer time as well, we can explore them. And I think one of the things to remember is that there is no right or wrong, that there are no fixed answers because we are working with people here and, and you are people who are different um, and each of us may have some different ideas and thoughts. So uh, yeah, if you have any answers as well, you can always put them in the chat and we can talk together about these things. So I hope you've um, found that useful just to have a little wriggle time. I always find it, you know, it's a long time, an hour and a half to just listen to me. What we're going to do is to think about um, some of the, the key elements now, and I'm just getting my screen going again. Um, some of the key elements to support those smooth transitions, keeping the parent, the child and the teacher very firmly in the center of all of this. And the first thing is about emotional connection. I just believe with all my heart, after all these years in education, that it's all about relationship. That good education is built on good relationships. Um, I think about my own children when they were at secondary school and the subjects that they did well at were the subjects that they liked the teacher. Weird, isn't it? They didn't do so well in the subjects where they didn't like the teacher or where they felt the teacher didn't like them. Uh, I remember my son saying to me, mum, the science teacher hates me. So I actually went in and had a meeting with the science teacher and I said, my son thinks that you hate him. And he was shocked. He said, well, I don't. I said, yes, but he has the perception that you do. And that needs addressing. I was, see, I was a bad parent. <laughs> I think it's really important for us to think about the emotional connections during these times of transition. Um, and, and this really links to that question about anxious parents, trying in any manner possible during these days of non-contact to work with an anxious parent is really important because an anxious parent brings about an anxious child and then an anxious child brings about all sorts of disturbances within the classroom. They, they struggle to, to settle, it, it rubs off on everybody else. We all start crying and it doesn't really bode well, does it? I, I would urge you to revisit some of the work of John Bowlby and Mary Ainsworth around attachment theory. I, I can remember studying it when I was back at university in the early 1980s um, and I wrote a whole assignment on it. But then 20, 25 years later, 
I had no recollection that I'd done that. And a colleague kept talking about attachment theory, and I thought, I don't know what that is. And then I found this assignment that I'd written. And it talks about children being born with that innate drive to form attachments with somebody. It's that thing that will mean I survive, as I talked about earlier. It's my means of survival is being connected to somebody older and wiser than me. Vygotsky mm -hmm. talks about the, the more supportive other. Somebody who knows a little bit more than me, somebody who will hold my hand, who will hold me, who will go with me through this journey. And he talks about availability and responsiveness as being key aspects of building a strong attachment. Adults who are available and accessible to the children. Adults who are warm. Mary Ainsworth continued the work of John Bowlby um, and, and looked at different styles of attachment, such as the avoidant insecure attachment. Uh, and, and there isn't time or space to, to really explore this today, but it's worth revisiting it when we're looking at how to meet the attachment needs of our children and their parents. I can remember in the Children's Centre that I, I talked about earlier, we were working with um, a family who um, just before the summer break, um, the father had died. He'd been taken into hospital and he died. And leaving the mother with an 18 month old, a three year old and a 13 year old. Yeah, the 13 year old, that's tricky, eh? And this little boy, this three year old, could not separate from his mother. He was very insecure. He'd said goodbye to his dad and never seen his dad again. His dad had gone forever. And so to say goodbye to mum was triggering those fears of if I let her go, I may never see her again. So you can imagine what it felt like for him. And it broke our hearts. I did quite a lot of work with the family during the summer holidays, getting him to come into the centre just to become familiar with us all, and with how things worked there. Um, we, we set up the key person for him so that that, that key person would greet mum. She used to throw her arms around mum, they'd have a really good chat. That warmth of relationship was really important for him to experience. She was always first on the door for him. He would come in a little bit later with mum. They, the, the setting were fantastic in that they were flexible. Think about that agility we talked about. Where they said to mum, well, you come in with your 18 month old and him. You can stay for the whole session if you want. And over an eight week period, mum, the 18 month old and the three year old would be there together. And we play little games of hide and seek with a timer. It was really, really critical that this little boy had an emotional connection with his new setting. And we could strengthen the relationship he had with his mum. It did take a long time. We did have him in play therapy as well. And it was really sad to see him take all the little figures with the sand tray, little figures of, um, of med medical people, and he just buried them under the sand, a way of expressing his anger. So that flexibility and agility of the staff allowed the relationship to grow, and it allowed that emotional connection. And that's one of the key in days prior to COVID was about building the emotional connection face to face. It's been difficult, hasn't it, to do that? And this was one of the questions about that separation anxiety um, and, and about anxious parents. It's been difficult because we can't build that connection in the same way. I have seen some Facebook posts and, and tweets um, saying, oh, it's been much better during COVID because we're not letting the parents in and they just let the children go at the gate and it's so much easier for everybody. And, and, I, and I've been thinking, oh, are people going to go back to that sort of scenario that I described earlier on where you just let them go at the gate and they come in and or are we going to continue to explore ways of having that soft start, that connection that can take place as parents come through the door, as we move forwards, so obviously at the moment it's difficult. Um, let's think about during COVID, how can we build those relationships with parents? The phone call, 
the phone call home occasionally, just checking in, how are you doing? Um, a Zoom conversation with the parents. As somebody was saying on here, they're struggling to un understand the online Zoom sessions. So maybe a one-to-one -one Zoom would be easier. Sometimes we've got to have that agility and that adaptability to be able to reduce some of the anxiety there and build the relationship. Um, I know we, we had lots and lots of, of Zoom conversations with parents. We, we had um, virtual parent coffee morning. Uh, we also did doorstep visits uh, prior to children starting and also some of our uh, parental support workers have been continuing to do doorstep visits which is like at least two meters away from the door um, just a way through the window a dropping off of, of a gift um, or, or just that human connection in some way and it's the importance also of the key person within the school who builds that relationship that individual who will have that close and loving relationship, both with the child and their family during the liminal space of the first few months or in their new context. Oh, I think I've, have I done that. No, that's fine. Uh, another thing that we've developed over um, many of the schools that I've worked with over the years has been the whole concept of a personal chatterbox. And some of you may have done this. It can be a chatter bag, a chatter tin, it can be a chatter anything. But this was something that we, we developed um, where the child would fill the box with the parents um, before they start in the setting or in the next class with things that are important to them, photographs of people that are important to them. Um, things like um, their last birthday card with the number three on it or the number four on it or maybe a little um, pair of slippers that they had when they were a baby a favorite toy um, photographs of the family I remember one nursery that I was working with in the baby room they had laminated photographs of all the families along the skirting board at the, at the base of, of the wall and these babies and toddlers would be going up and kissing the photographs during the day Emotional connection is really important. And with the chatterbox, the chatter bag idea, or the chatter whatever you want, it might be a virtual chatter, that child is bringing with them something that is theirs and is precious to them and sharing it to build a new relationship with you. So I'd highly commend the whole idea of chatterboxes. We've now used them um, up to year one really successfully in our school. And I know many places that do that. Obviously, they wouldn't be expected to stand in front of the whole class and share it. It would be shared in small groups, again, to build emotional connection. The next uh, part that I want us to think about, as, as I reflected on transition, was about this familiarity and continuity. And thinking about my own trip up to Derby all the time, I had the emotional connections there. Uh, which really helped me. But now there's that familiarity for me where suddenly things start to feel normal. I can remember walking down to the house that I was buying uh, every time I came up, just so I could see the route from my parents to my house um, and I could become familiar with it. And what's the parking like in the area? And is it the same on a Sunday as it is on a Friday? And different days of the week and different times of the day, what does it feel like? Transitions are made easier when there's familiar things around. So, for example, a child might bring uh, a familiar toy with them. This is um, my deputy head's little boy, um, at Avery. And uh, when he started with the childminder, he took his rabbit with him everywhere. You see him clutching the rabbit. And on the second photograph, you can see how the rabbit's now at the bottom of the slide, which for me is symbolic of our learning to let that go. But it was the familiar, bringing that continuity, that familiarity with me so that I have a link with home. I can remember when I started in reception, taking things off children as they came through the door. No, you don't need that. And I feel really bad now. I think that was wicked. That was cruel. We rather wean them off it rather than wrench it from them. Give them time to learn to let go of them. So that familiarity with a little boy whose dad had died, we discovered that he loved Noddy. And so we created a little Noddy box. So the first thing that he got when he came in <coughs> was his little box of Noddy books and, um, and Noddy items, Noddy memorabilia, which was the familiar for him. 
gave him continuity from home. Familiarity is developed in all sorts of ways. So I'm just going to stop share, screen sharing for a minute. There we go. So you can see me, hopefully. So hopefully you can still hear me. Um, sometimes that knocks, knocks us out. Um, familiarities develop through visits to the new setting with their parents or their other carers. So they go and visit it. They visit the new class, they visit the new site. Um, it can be quite tricky now, but encourage parents to drive past your school or walk past your school a number of times before they start so that they get used to that route. A bit like me when I was walking from my parents to my new house. Um, think about how the parents can make the children familiar with the building. <coughs> I know uh, we, we filmed a tour um, of our early years and put it online <coughs> during lockdown last year so that children could, could see it physically and they could negotiate their way around the um, virtual tour. I would always run a handover meeting when my children left reception. So I would physically take the children and the parents to their new classroom and we'd do a physical handover. I would introduce the new teacher and, and I, me and her would run the meeting together so that it was actually, I'm, I'm the familiar one and I'm handing you to somebody who's unfamiliar, but will become familiar. But it also means that in our classrooms, we will have things that are familiar. That our classrooms will, will include things that children know already. So having objects that they will come across from home is really important. Our home corner will be filled with real life objects that reflect the, what our children will have come from. And also within our, within our school, we have created classrooms from our nursery right up to year two that look very familiar. And I'm going to share these with you right now, um, some of the photos. So I'm going to share my screen again. So here we go. This is um, <coughs> taken from our website and, and this is the overview of our nursery. So for our three-year-olds. Now it does look a little bit sparse at the moment because it was done during lockdown last year. But those little blobs are places that you can click on so that you can actually, that there's some statements come up about what they would do there. And the circles on the ground are places that you can go and visit. It's a bit like when you, you see a virtual house um, for when you're buying a new house. Um, that, that's what our nursery looked like. And I want to move it on to another slide, another image of that. And I've put the link at the bottom there, it's Lakenham Primary and Nursery School. So if you're interested in having a look at it, um, you'll be able to, to find that. But here again, you can see some aspects of the nursery classroom. Now the next slide is going to show you what the reception classroom looked like. So for our four and five year olds, a similar feel to it, <coughs> very familiar and this is for 60 children, this unit. It's a double classroom, it's next door to the nursery and it's got a very small room at the side for block play. But again, you can see how children would come in and think, ah, there's a familiarity here. So we're going from that to that. And just some more views. This is our block room, you can see. And then also the home corner, which is familiar to the children. It's things that they may have at home um, that, that are familiar to them. But then what do we do next? Well, into year one, we felt that we wanted it to be familiar for them and provide that continuity again. So here you can see a year one home corner and a year one block and small world area. The children were able to come in and feel immediately at home. It has changed the transitions year by year within our school. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. And the children know what's expected. They immediately go in there. One of the things I talk a lot about within our school <coughs> is the importance of continuity and progression. It's not the same as it was in nursery. It's progressed, but there is that continuous thread, that ethos, that 
pedagogical approach that flows through. And we then take that through into year one and two, and we have a big shared space for our year one and two in, at the end of our library, which is just outside the year, the year one classrooms and the year two classrooms. It doesn't look like nursery exactly, but it's got that flavour of it. <coughs> and one of the things on our CPD days is that we, we, we send all our teachers right up to year six across the school to have an environment walk. And they look for these two key things. Where's the continuity and where's the progression? How is it age appropriate? But also how is it very much creating that familiarity and continuity for our children? It's very exciting to see that we're now up to year three and year three is looking amazingly familiar and year four five and six have got elements of familiarity they've all got block play we also think about <coughs> expectations around routines and the familiar routines and we have a little phrase choose it use it put it away well we've added in choose it use it wash it put it away so that our children right across our school know that expectation if they're changing expectations every year it becomes very confusing and they're using their working memory to work out well but what do we do here rather than thinking about the sort of learning that's taking place um, another way of, of including familiarity is about an adult who moves with the children in in the school that i worked in 15 years ago now um in fact more than that my youngest son couldn't escape one of the adults when he was in the in the nursery he had Mrs Lopez with him as, as one of the adults. She moved up with the class into reception. So he still had Mrs Lopez. And then blow me, she moved into year one with him. He could not escape. Do you know, it was brilliant because she knew him inside and out. And she was his familiar adult for three whole years. So that's something else to consider. Is there an adult who could move with them? Then in that situation, the year one TA, um, teaching assistant would come and work in reception for the year. And then we'd have this two year cycle of the adults going round. It was just a fluke that you had them in nursery as well. Um, so think about the adults and think about, and I'm going to introduce you to a friend of mine right now. I, I've been making school assemblies recently on Zoom um, and I've really enjoyed it. And so I've introduced a friend of mine. Here she is. Uh, this is Jasmine, come back. Here we go. This is a different group. This is not the children. This is a conference over in Dubai. I know, I know. They're all there watching. Sorry, I get a bit carried away when I get a puppet on my hand. But could you think about having a puppet that moves with the children through your school? So they're one of the classmates. So Jasmine would go from nursery into, into the next year, into the next year, and follow them through. Now, she might change her accent over time as she has different adults working with her. Jasmine has been a great tool for uh, over lockdown because the children adore her. They all talk about Mrs. Charlie's assembly with Jasmine and she's become that familiar um, adult. No, you're not an adult, you're a puppet. I know, remember that. Let me get rid of it before I start getting carried away. Third, uh, then I want you to remember that what we're doing is building foundations year on year. <laughs> and I've put a foundation picture on here. Um, when you build a house, you don't build beautiful foundations and bring everybody to look at the foundations and say, isn't it wonderful? And then go and build the house somewhere else. What you do is you build those strong foundations and then you continue to build on that foundation until you've got a good solid structure. Too many schools celebrate their early years and their early childhood education, and then suddenly go straight into formal education, not building, on the strengths of their children, on the strengths of the curriculum and the pedagogical approach. I've got the great joy of, of uh, working with a group of schools in China, and uh, we are looking at how the grade one and two over in China can be much more aligned to the foundation years of the early childhood and the kindergarten. It's a really exciting project. And this is what we've been doing in our school. How can we build year on year? so that our children have that continuity. <coughs> the third thing to consider is purpose and meaning during transitions. 
what helped me move to Derby was knowing that I was coming with a purpose. And so even during this, this lockdown that we are currently in, in England, having that purpose has been really useful for me. It's really helped me emotionally because my purpose has been to come and care for my parents. And so on a daily basis, I'll be shopping for them or I'll go and play the piano and sing with them. Um, but it's given me a real purpose for this transition. Think about our children. What purpose is transition for them? They have no idea. They don't know why they're being hauled here and there and everywhere. Build a sense of anticipation when you're welcoming the children into you for the first time. Maybe having children who are currently there sharing some of the things that they're doing, sharing some of the exciting things that they can anticipate. So we're creating that sense of, wow, I know why I'm going there because I'm going to be doing this and I'm going to be doing that. One of the things that uh, we created was an aspiration board. I didn't call it that with the children, but before the children started, we asked them what they were hoping for, for the next year. What did they want to learn? What did they want to do? Now they often can tell you what they want to do and not always tell you what they want to learn. Um, and what we did was we put a photograph up on the display board of the child with a speech bubble, just expressing what they wanted to do or to learn. And again, this could be something that is done virtually. It doesn't have to be done face to face. <coughs> um, and what we would do is refer to that board then throughout the year. <coughs> One of the challenging ones was a child was saying, I want to learn how to be a helicopter in the playground. That was quite a challenge, that one. But so at some point during the year, we went out onto the playground and pretended to be helicopters. But it's giving them something to aspire to, something to look forward to, a purpose, a meaning for this thing that I don't quite understand. <coughs> a fourth point, a fourth key thing is about information. Do you know it's an essential part of transition is information. But we can be in danger of information overload, overload. And I often do um, show arounds at our school for new parents, which actually we've been doing virtually during lockdown. So um, we have our virtual tour, but then we, we actually do it using a phone and walk around the school and things. Um, but we can be in danger of giving too much information to all at once. I used to run um, new intake meetings and I remember the pack they would go out with. Um, when I do show arounds with parents, I give them this big pack and I think, oh my goodness. And we have many parents who don't speak English. So sometimes we've got a translator with us um, and we've got to have things translated on our website. We try to put things um, in a format that can be translated. But think about what is it we want to get across? Who's informing who during this period? <coughs> Remember, there's parents who want to know a lot of stuff. Have we ever asked our parents, what, would, what information would you find most useful when you start? Ask last year's parents, what information was useful for you? But remember that we as a school want to know a load of stuff. So think about what is it parents want to know and what is it the school wants to know? And what do they want you to know? What do parents want to tell you about their child? Really important to think about the information that they can give you about their child. I always remember that, that wonderful phrase, parents are the experts about their own children. We are the experts on child development and pedagogy. Um, and what we're doing is creating a partnership of that sharing of information. I, I know sometimes it's, it's easy to think, oh, parents, they tell me their child can count to 100 backwards and forwards and stand on their head and in twos and fives, and they're only three. Um, and we go, oh, yeah. But actually, if they say that, we enter a dialogue. Oh, tell me about that. What does that mean? When have they done that? That's incredible. So that we dig deeper and we use what the parents say as a way of forming a communication link with them. 
and a connection. The school also has lots to tell the parents. So the parents got lots to tell you. The school has got a lot to tell the parents. Again, let's, let's tell them what they most need at the right time. And I love to run workshops with parents. <clears throat> and sometimes schools want to run their phonics workshop as the first workshop that they run. Well, I, I would recommend that actually they don't need to know that first. The first thing they probably need to know is how do children learn? How do our children learn? Maybe something on well-being and involvement, the characteristics of effective learning. Inform the parents on how children learn so that over that year, the parent will understand why you do what you do. And you don't have to constantly explain, well, play is really important. So thinking about, you need to know, when's the right time to share bits of information with our parents? Are we addressing the things that keep parents awake at night? But then we've also got the information from the previous teacher. Um, that previous teacher, what are they going to pass on? What information are they going to tell you? Um, and I know in many schools in the UK, the information that's passed on can sometimes be limited to their scores in English and maths. Um, I know um, that the nursery that spoke uh, about um, transition spoke a lot about the data that's passed on. That's a really useful seminar to watch, so I'm not going to go into all that detail here. But think about what's the most important information to be passed on. It's not just about their scores. It's actually about this child and who they are and how they learn, not just what they learn. How are they learning? How do they operate within the characteristics of effective learning? What does their personal, social, and emotional development look like? We know those three prime areas, communication and language, personal, social, and emotional, and physical development are critical. They're critical building blocks which need to be looked at carefully and considered as we plan for the next stage. So think about the previous teacher. And again, Julie Fisher says that if we acknowledge that children bring with them a wealth of skills, knowledge and understanding that's already well established and foundational, then the key task for us is to identify precisely what these are so we can build on them build on their existing competencies and plan for where we go next with it. Really critical that we're building on that. I remember a nursery teacher once saying to me, oh, Judith, the nursery children this year, they've come in with nothing. And I looked at her and said, they've come in with nothing. Are they lying on, a, on a, one of those hospital trolleys and they're just wheeled in and then we sort of pump them up and we fill them up with things. <clears throat> really, do they come with nothing? Nothing critical that we receive from previous settings, from parents, from the previous teacher, information that tells me who this child is. Who is this unique, competent, capable individual? They don't come with nothing. They are not just empty vessels that we fill. <laughs> so it's about what they've learned, but what also how they learn. And Here's an example from uh, Hangzhou Bilingual Nursery School in China. Um, they've been experimenting with a learning story um, written to the child <coughs> as part of their reporting structure. And this one I thought was delightful. This was used um, during that transitional time. So it's, it's written as a letter. You know, I've enjoyed having you in your class, seeing your progress. When you entered, you were two and you were polite and quiet. And, and I was amazed at what you knew. You're, you're such a positive, smiley, happy child. You're a joy to teach. I mean, it's beautiful. And then it relates into, I can see progress in communication. and um, Crystal clear that you love arts and design, and cutting and gluing, etc. It identifies an area that she doesn't really explore much. Um, and also ties into next year, again, giving that purpose and meaning. Next year, you'll be able to form special relationships with other children. And she talks about, I hope the love of learning continues. I'm positive you're ready. Beautiful. And then um, here was another bit which came from the Chinese teacher. Um, I hope your love of learning continues. Make sure you practice over the summer. Beautifully written, beautifully written as a letter to the child. Consider maybe a letter to the child. 
as the child prepares to move either into or out of your setting. Um, so finally, clear communication. It's really important. And I just want to have a bit of fun with you at this point because we're coming to an end. And I think you're probably all really tired and hungry as I am. Um, my friend in China, my colleague in China, uh, sent me some examples that she's used on her professional development day about the British. And I can say this because I'm English through and through. I've worked in South Africa in a cross-cultural context. So I'm quite aware of my Britishness and things that I do and say. And some of you may know this. I've just pulled out a couple of things, um, things about what the British say and what they really mean. So when somebody like myself says, I hear what you say, yeah, I hear what you say. Other people may well think, oh, they accept my view. They're hearing me, they're listening to me. What I really mean is I actually disagree with you. Discussion over. I know it's a bit stereotypical, forgive me. I'm having a bit of fun. When the British say, with the greatest respect, others may think, oh, they're really listening to me. They really respect me. Whereas what I really mean is, I think you're an idiot. It's bad, isn't it? Uh, when the British say, oh, it's quite good, others might understand, oh, they think it's quite good. Whereas what I really mean is it's a bit disappointing. When I say, I was a bit disappointed that... Others may well feel, oh, it doesn't really matter. Whereas what I really mean is I'm annoyed. When the British say, I'm sure it's my fault, others may understand, well, why do they think it's their fault? Why are they blaming themselves? Whereas what I really mean is it's your fault. And finally, and this is my favorite, and this is one that we often say as British, um, oh, you must come for dinner. And so others may think, oh, oh, great, there's an invitation on the way. Yay! I'm going to be going for dinner. Whereas what I really mean is I'm just being polite because that's something that we say. Now, I know that's stereotypical, um, and, and I apologise if it's been offensive to anybody, but I really resonated with that. <laughs> and, and think about what it can mean in terms of communication in our schools. We may think we're communicating something, but somebody else may hear it a different way. We may think that our message is clear, but the people hearing it think it's cluttered. How can we reduce the anxiety about this? How can we make sure that our communication is as clear as it possibly can be? Um, I remember posting photographs of what a good lunchbox looks like um, so that the parents could not go through the anxiety that I had as a parent of not knowing what to put in the lunchbox. Just some photographs of, here's some things you could put in your lunchbox. This has been particularly needed in the school where I am at the moment, where um, sometimes some of our children have come in with six little cakes because they were reduced at the local shop and the family's struggling financially. And so they've seen them for 10p and they've put them in the lunchbox and that's what they have for lunch. So how do we communicate that quite clearly? Um, I remember uh, there was a family in, in one of the schools like where I worked where they, they didn't speak English at all and, and the lunchbox had come in like that. So I went to our Lithuanian school secretary um, who I knew could speak several Eastern European languages and I said, please, can you ring up and just talk to them? Well, she was ranting ah, on the phone, but. The message got through and she was able to communicate it. Think about clarity of communication. Things on your website. Is the website easy to get through? Can the parents find what they most need on your website? Emails, tweeting, Facebook, all sorts of different media that we can now communicate. Absolutely critical. If you have parent notice boards, Keep them uncluttered, keep them clear. Just a few key messages, lovely photographs. I can remember seeing a fantastic parent notice board in a school once. I said, oh, that's brilliant. I love your notice board. Can I have a photograph of it? And she said, of course you can. She said, it's a pity the parents never see it. I said, why? What do you mean? She said, well, they all line up on the playground. They never come in here, so they don't ever see the notice board. And I thought, well, there's a big disconnect here. If we're going to be communicating via a notice board, make sure it's where the parents hang out, where they can see it, a place where they can um, get the key messages. Well, I, I, I 
I've talked lots and lots and lots here about those things. Um, I've shared some of my heart and some of my passion for you. I hope that's come across. I'm, I'm coming to the end of my keynote. And I want to just remind you of some of the messages that I've shared with you today and some of my, my key thinking. As I say, my thinking is not at the end. I constantly think, and having been in school again um, for, the, for the last two years, albeit from a distance over the last three months, um, I have learned so much more and I'm constantly learning. Supporting smooth transitions are these five key things that I haven't drawn from anybody else other than my own experiences at this point in time. That emotional connection, that establishing that familiarity and continuity, building year on year on those foundations, giving children purpose and meaning. So they've got no choice over coming to school. So how can we give them a sense of purpose and ownership when they do come? Making sure that the information that we give and receive is meaningful for families and for us. And also that clarity of communication, ensuring that our message is heard in the right way, that we're able to communicate effectively and efficiently. We've talked about the importance of these three key players within times of transition, that parent, that child, that teacher, the three working together in order to support that transitional period. Because remember, it's not just the child who's transitioning, it's everybody in that relationship. Um, you may, at the, end, at the beginning of every school year, have said these words, oh my goodness, it's the worst class I've ever had. My goodness, they're so far behind. Oh, what am I gonna do? You know, we do that every year, don't we? Just remember, because what happens is, we build these children over the year and they become so different to when they started. We build this little community, this safe, secure, learning, curious community, which they weren't when they came in at the beginning. And at the end, we send them off as these curious, amazing learners. And then we get this other bunch who come in and we go, oh, it's the worst yet. No, we've just forgotten. So we're constantly in that state of transition as well. Thinking about keeping the child at the centre. Remember Julie Fisher's books. Uh, I, would, I would recommend all of her books. And she's rewritten the Moving On to Key Stage One. And incidentally, she, she came to our school to visit to talk to us about that. So uh, we're quite excited. Um, but read anything by Julie Fisher because she always keeps the child right at the heart of, of what she's doing and, and, and of her work. Remember, I talked about the liminal space of uncertainty, that space between what we were and what we will be, the betwixt and the between. I'm not what I was, but I'm not what yet what I will be. Um, it's a bit like me as I approach retirement. I know I don't look old enough, but as I approach retirement, I feel a bit of betwixt and between. Before, when I was coming up here all the time to Derby, I didn't know where I belonged. I was Norwich for several days a week, where my school was, I was in Ipswich, where my family were, and then I was in Derby, where my parents were, constantly betwixt and between, that liminal space. How can we create safety and security, support within the liminal space for our children and our families? And remembering that agility and curiosity, build on the natural curiosity of our children as they go through transition, but also be agile ourselves, be flexible, Remember, it's about meeting the needs of our children rather than just meeting the needs of our system. But the big question then is, so what? You've heard me talk at length about all sorts of things and just sharing my passion. Take what you need from this. Some of you might say, well, there was nothing new there. I've learned nothing. And I always say, well, that's good. It's obviously affirmed everything that you already know. And, and I remember crying once, I, I heard um, somebody who, who was an amazing early years advocate and speaker, Helen Bromley, and some of you will have heard of her. I remember the first time I heard her speak, I cried. I sat at that, I was supposed to be running a workshop after her, and, and I sat and wept because everything she said resonated with me. Everything she said, the things that I felt and I believed, 
And I wept because it was an emotional moment. Here's somebody who says the same, speaks the same language. Well, hopefully we, we've resonated in some way and it's affirmed a lot of what you already do. And I know you do remarkable things. I came to Dubai two years ago um, and worked with a couple of the kindergartens out there. I had an amazing time. I was blown away by what, what some, some of the things that are happening out in Dubai in some of your schools. It was a beautiful time. I often feel I learn more when going different places than actually I deliver. So be affirmed. But maybe there's been a couple of things that have been new. Maybe the thing about the liminal space has been a new concept and you want to look further into it. Maybe there's things that's challenged your thinking. Maybe in, in your setting, you are more concerned about the child fitting into you than actually the setting becoming a little bit more flexible to the needs of the family. So maybe there's been something that's challenged. But my, my final thought is, so what are you going to do? What things in your team would be useful to discuss as a result of this? Uh, as I said earlier, watch the, the um, video from the other nursery. It was, it was fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Practical ways that they've looked at the transition into key stage one. So, so what is the important question? What happens next? Smooth transitions work for everyone. What we call the beginning is often the end. And to make an end is to make a beginning. The end is where we start from. And this is the end of me. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you understood the accent okay. Thank you so much, Jude. That was um, amazing. And I think, you know, for you to talk about, you know, whether we're learning something new or we're getting those affirmations, for me, just a couple of things sort of really stood out. And I think the biggest one was that um, transition is a good space to be in. You know, we always have a wonderful experience in the year. And I always dread that transition sort of. And I think it's that letting go and, and a change for us, more so to the children. But to, to sort of think about it as a positive rather than a, as a negative or a change, yeah. it sort of changes your whole mindset, doesn't it? Um, and it changes that way that we think that this, this is something to look forward to rather than something that we don't want to happen and it's got to happen. And I think it's more for us to feel that of us letting go, it's not really always about the children, it's about us because we have this great year together, don't we? And then you get to that point of letting go. And I think you're right, having potentially a member of staff to go up and to have that physical handing over of, of, your, of you because the children become you they become a part of you. And I think that's the hardest thing. I think when you're emotionally connected to the children, you emotionally feel everything that they're going to feel. And, and, I, and I think the second part for me was, um, you know, when you said you, ha you have a child, but you have the family package, you know, you're so right. You know, you don't just have those 25 children in your class. You have 25 families in your class. And I think for me, that was really, really true because Every day you're thinking not just about the child, but you're thinking about the parents and thinking about how what you're doing in the class is going to affect their life and their long term future. And I think that's yeah. just key. And, and something that I'm thinking about is I'd love the idea um, and the concept of only having a two transition points. So the start of the journey of a school and the end point and how yeah. can we go about um, doing that? Have you got any sort of tips of, of, of things that you've seen of, you know, maybe that first point of how you could sort of take away other transition points? I know you've showed the environment um, and how similar it is. Is there anything else that you feel that we could do to start, start thinking now of how to take away some of those transition points? Um, I think the environment is a big one and it is a key because, because it is knowing where things are and, and, and how things work in a place it really helps you. You know, if you start in a new school, just knowing where to go for things and where, you know, where to go for a cup of coffee and, and which mug to use is really important. Um, I think the visits um, before you, you start in there are really important. Actually having substantial time in that new new space is really important not just a day not just oh we've got transition week but actually you know critical times throughout the year we in our school we have a downstairs and an upstairs and and it's sometimes the children's transition from downstairs to upstairs is really traumatic because they've got to use the stairs 
So we talk a lot about how can we make it more natural throughout the year? So they're having a reason to go and visit a different part of the school, not just in the few weeks before they move. So I think it's looking for natural things across the year. I think it's thinking about your routines. Uh, one of the things at our school is we talk about your first two or three weeks. The routine should be very similar to the routine as it was at the end of their year in their previous year. So keeping some of those key routines, we're not just going straight in with a, an older child's routine. We're building it gently over that period of time. I think those are some of the, the, the key things for me that have been important. Um, it's also when you're looking at your environment, planning that next environment to have some of the resources that they would have had that are familiar, and then to start adding in the unfamiliar. So the more challenging things over time, but not to just throw it all in at the beginning, to actually start with what, they, what the children will know and then bring that progression in and to plan it against the curriculum. Don't just repeat what they've done before. Think about your next stage curriculum and, and how your environment will support that. So I think those are just a few. I don't know whether that helps. No, thank you, Jude. And if anyone's got any else, has got any questions, I've written a couple down here from the from the um, chat as well. But if anybody else has got any questions, feel free to add it into the chat. The other thing that I found really useful, um, Jude, was when you're talking about Maslow, and actually for us to plan in our first week, our transition week, in a sense, thinking about you know the importance, the things of, like you know the toilet, about what time are we eating? Yeah. Because you know when I was planning today, I had the plan of action when we're actually having our breaks and we're having our lunch, so people know and there's visuals there, so you can say we can get yes. we can get past yes. this. And you know as adults, we think about it all the time. And I think for us to think about it from a child's point of view, um, and you know I totally agree with you. Actually going to that child level and thinking yeah. as a child would do, and 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 you know actually visually seeing what it would look like for a child in that first. Yeah. You know first important week and i think one of the challenges can i just, can I just oh sorry yeah i was just going to so carry on there. right through our school we've now got visual timetables because um the teachers always always thought that that was for special needs and and one of the critical things during those transitional times is to see that visual timetable up and the children come in and because they're now used to using it from nursery but it's that key thing that they can go to and go, ah, yes, this is something familiar. I can really tune into that. I know how this thing works. Sorry, carry on. No, no, I, I totally agree with you. And, and one of the things that we use actually is quite um, good for all the children is this a now and next. So they see two points. Yes. Because sometimes yeah. the whole day is overload, isn't it? And you're thinking, and it also for some children, it feels like such a long way when there's five or 10 pictures till home time. And Absolutely. that's the first thing, the first thing they look for is when it's home time. And that's, you know, it's, it's natural. It doesn't mean they're not enjoying themselves or no. they're, they're loving it because they want to be with their family and they want to be in their home environment, you know, as do we all. So Absolutely. I think one of the things that I like is using a now and next so they can just see yes. the next two steps. Um, and then you feel like, oh, I can do that. And the next yeah. two steps. And that, and that works really well for us. Yeah. I was thinking about those challenges um, for us, you know, if a child's, in Dubai, we've got some children, and across the Middle East, and I know in, in the UK, the children are online the whole yeah. time. So yeah. how can we build in those transitions and um, that settling in for those children who haven't experienced school at all? They've, they've only experienced the world of online. And, you know, and I know one of the questions was that anxiety for parents. How can we sort of support those parents when everybody's online and they haven't had that contact? And you talk about you know, those relationships, building those physical relationships, how, and any top tips really with, oh. with an online learning hat on? Oh dear, <laughs> it's incredibly tough. I, I think I, one of the things that concerns me is how in, in England, I don't know whether it's happening out there, but with the online learning stuff, um, it's suddenly become very formal and worksheet heaven and, and, um, my friend who's the nursery manager sent me some pictures of one of um, the work that had come to one of her children from the school because the child stayed in the nursery rather than going to school uh, and it's just like adding sums and it's real really formal and it just horrified me 
And I think one of the things we've got to try and equip our parents with is the knowledge that play is okay and that talking is good. And I think those are two key messages to equip the school, the, um, the families, that as they're preparing to send their children to school, play lots and what that might look like. Cook lots with your children, talk with your children. So it's about the parents feeling equipped with the right language before the children even start. So I think that's one key thing that we can do. We, we've been making little videos and just sending little videos. So they get familiar with the person. So before the children actually start, a little introductory video and saying something personal about you, oh, I really like to do this and I really like to do that. So that it's almost establishing a human connection rather than it just being about school and work. So that's been something that we found very successful. Um, I, I do think the phone call is really important. So particularly during these days, um, yes, we can do the Zoom meetings, we can do all of that, but a phone call, it's quite a traditional way of communicating, but I think it's an important way. Parents, as children go through school, parents tend to only get a phone call when something's gone wrong. And I'm really keen that we do those positive phone calls home. And that can be established as we are in times of transition, where the only reason I'm ringing is just to say, hello, how are you doing? Um, anything I can help you with? Um, any information you might need from us, so that it's a relationship that's built over the phone. It's a bit like having a, 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 a long distance love affair. Um, you know, we, you, you're not held back by the fact that you can't see each other. Um, you find other ways to build rapport and relationship. It mustn't just be about the work. It must be about the human connection through whatever means. I don't know whether that helps answer that question, but definitely do definitely. And I think one of the things that I've I've liked and I've seen, um, and I want to incorporate is we did last year we did videos to the children from each of the teachers about themselves and from the assistants and and from the classroom environment. What I'd really like to do is for the children to do a video of themselves and their family and to send yes. it to each other. So what would be really nice because it's from our point of view, but actually be really nice for the parents and the children to to do a video about them about their home and what they like. Um, because then we get to know their families and the other children then get to know each other. Yes. And I think that, that sort of relationship building was just in a different way. And I think one of the things... And that's that like a do, home visit, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. And actually the parents are in control um, of that as well. Yeah. So they're feeling confident. And one of the things that I think works really well from feedback across the network, across the Middle East, has been the live teaching. Now, I know at the very beginning of our lockdown experience from March, we were lots of people doing videos and doing uploads on Seesaw and different platforms. And I think then things do lead to more formal because you're giving them something to do. Yeah. But actually, when you have a live session, you're releasing that parent from that teaching responsibility. Um, and I think that was the key because you're taking that on. And yes, it's a challenge, you know, but there's so many fun things that you can do live. It doesn't have to be long, five, 10 minutes. But then the parents there are just the audience and that reassures them and actually shows them how we teach. And actually for them to do a scavenger hat around the, the, the house and find, you know, three red objects, they're doing counting, they're looking at numbers, they're doing great listening skills. So actually what we're looking for isn't what the parents think, it's actually in a different... So we're teaching the parents. And I think that was a key um, for the success of online learning in, in the Middle East because yeah. we were teaching not just the children and the parents but then again it's the confidence of the teacher because you know now it's that learning curve that we can do anything on zoom and it's okay if we make mistakes and I think for yes. us to be human and know that we're not going to get it right the first time and we've got to be reflective is the key so um I I think that's really key one of the things I want to try and do is I love your tea and tissues um concept and I was thinking we could have a virtual breakout room for parents if, we're, if they're online you know, there's that option yes. there. Um, and yeah. I, I love that idea. And in, in the Middle East, we've got our delivery. So you could always, um, you know, would be great if we can send a coffee to every parent if they're at home. Oh, Things like that, you know. Um, yes. if, money, if money's no object, wouldn't that be great? Um, and I think building that emotional connection. And if we find out, you know, even the smallest things, I was making notes for myself, even the smallest things of finding out, you know, do they drink cappuccino or Americano? Something like that for the parents. Yeah. You know them yeah. straight away. Yeah. I know it sounds silly, but actually we're thinking about that family package. It's not just about the child, it's about the parent. And I think we always have to have that in our mindset. 
Um, and I think you I, know, I know one thing. One thing we've we've started at school is that um, for the online teaching at the moment, um, they have chat time so that they have an informal Zoom meeting for the children and just one adult in the room with them. And they just chat about anything. And it's about coming off the agenda because we're constantly on an agenda as schools. We're trying to tell somebody something or teach them something. Whereas we need to release that a little bit. And I dipped in as assistant head. I dipped into our year five, year fours last week to have a chat and I took my puppet with me and we had an absolute hoot. It was really lovely because we were chatting about anything and everything. It wasn't just about this school agenda. Definitely. Oh, and, I, and, and I think my last point is actually listening to your keynote speaker, and listening to Greg's uh, keynote speak yesterday, he was talking about observations and delivering observations to parents for video. So then I was thinking to myself, I loved when you were reading about the letter that the teacher wrote um, um, to the child, a real personal touch. And then I was thinking to myself, wouldn't that be great if we could do a video to that child? Yes. Just about, and rather than a letter to have, do an actual video um, and to the yeah. child. And then actually for the parent and the child to do a video back to us, you know, so it's a two way process. Um, I really yeah. like that concept and that's something that I would like to explore. And um, so if my team are listening, that's something that I'd like to explore oh. as well for, for our school. But Jude, thank you yeah. so much. I, I'm just checking. I think I went thank through you. all the questions. Um, that was fantastic. And my brain and my ideas are just are, are going uh, are, are going full flow now. Um, so thank you again, Jude. That was um, amazing. And amazing listening I to you. I secretly enjoyed it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and you made time go so quickly. I would just realise it's five past one. I haven't realised that. We started at 11.15. Mm -hmm. So you make time go really quickly. So thank you so much for that. And I think you, you're allowed to have breakfast now, just if you haven't had it yet. Anna, so. you can have lunch. <laughs> We're on lunch. I'm just going to share my screen quickly just to let everybody know what, where we're at. Can I say bye-bye now? Thank you, Jude. Thank you so much again for your time. Pleasure. Okay, so um, you'll be pleased to know we're at break time again. So we have break from 1 to 1.30. And then after the break, you've got your last time to watch your recordings for today. Obviously, all of the recordings are available for the next academic year. So you can choose one to watch now. And don't worry, because you'll be able to watch those um, across the year and actually re revisit them with your team. So it may be um, that you're watching one today and you think, do you know what? I want to watch this with my team. I want to generate more ideas. And I think every time you watch something, you learn something new every time. So for the next sessions, we've got Bob Easton looking at uh, bringing the parents into the conversation. We've got Karen Wilding looking at mark making. And we've got Jude as well looking at how we can bring music in. Um, and I was looking forward to a song. So maybe we can do a song at the end together. But enjoy your break. And I will uh, see you back live with me at 2.30 for our closing and reflections. Don't forget to add to the Padlet page as well um, so we can see um, all the learning from today. So enjoy your lunch. Take care.